Um, and so, um, yeah, just be aware of that, um, that we're recording and you will, of course, have access to the recording um, during the coming week. Um, please also for anyone who would like to gain um, CPD points, um, please send us your professional, uh, professional council number um, in the chat. Um, and please do that um, as a direct message to the host um, so that we are able to ensure that you do earn um, CPD points. And then throughout the session, um, please ask any questions or provide any comments in the chat. Um, the facilitators for the session may also ask certain questions during the presentation, so it would really be good if you respond um, by providing your input in the chat as well, and please try to keep yourself um, muted during the session to avoid any interruptions. Um, and then also um, at the end of the session, we'd really like to get your feedback on um, how you found the session. And so we'll be sharing a link to the evaluation um, form in the chat, and we'd really appreciate your feedback. This will really help us in terms of um, planning for future webinar series. So for today's um, program, we will have um, a Mentimeter uh, poll, um, sorry, a Zoom poll to actually just get to know a little bit about who you are. Um, and I think that will just guide us in terms of the discussions that we'll be able to have. Um, and unfortunately, in a big group, this is one of the ways that we can get to know who you are. Um, then I'll hand over to Mary, um, who will be the one introducing methods for conducting scoping reviews. And she'll also be giving um, an example from her own work. Um, and then um, I'll speak to um, PRISMA, which is a reporting guideline for scoping reviews, and also speak to um, journals where you can publish um, scoping reviews. And then there'll be an opportunity, a lot of time left for any questions, um, for any discussion um, that, that you'd like to have um, based on the content. Okay, um, so um, I'll hand over to Zianda, who will um, help us with facilitating um, the Zoom poll. Um, Ziander, over to you. Hi, colleagues. Um, so you should be able to see a set of questions on your screen. If you can just perhaps um, answer those. Um, there's four questions, um, and I'll I'll probably just give um, a minute and then publish the results and then hand over back to B. Please let me know if you can't see the questions. I can see them, Zianda. Thanks. Thanks. So the responses are coming in nicely. We have 16 participants uh, that have completed out of. Yeah, so um, I see that 21 participants have um, responded to the questions. Um, there's a distribution between people's different professional backgrounds um, in terms of um, some being health professionals, academics, researchers, um, people who work in technical support, um, postgraduate students, health managers, um, and other um, professional backgrounds. And then there's also a relatively um, equal distribution between qualitative and quantitative researchers, and then um, some of us here being mixed method researchers, um, which is really great, especially for scoping reviews. Um, they lend themselves to both qualitative and quantitative um, research methods. Um, and then um, about 78% of people saying that they haven't conducted a scoping review. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll try and take it easy. And this, uh, this week you'll, you'll get um, an introduction to the methods and next week um, there will be two colleagues who will be sharing um, specific examples of different types of scoping reviews they've conducted. So that will further advance your understanding of um, scoping reviews. And then um, most people are attending because they would like to learn how to conduct a scoping review. 
um, but also some people who are interested in um, applying evidence from scoping reviews and also teaching um, others on scoping reviews. So quite a good um, range of participants today. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, Mary, I'm going to hand over to you. Um, Mary Keeney is a um, health policy and systems researcher um, focusing on maternal and um, newborn health issues um, and also implementation research. She's a postdoctoral candidate um, in the School of Public Health. And yeah, Mary has um, experience in conducting scoping reviews and will be sharing um, some of the methods and her own um, experiences with that. So over to you, Mary. Thanks so much, B, and greetings, everyone. Um, I hope my connection stays strong for the presentation. Um, but if you can't hear me or if I'm talking too fast, uh, please uh, put that message in the chat and I'll um, slow down or work with my connection. Uh, thank you, B, uh, for inviting me to speak to everyone today. Um, so I'm just going to talk about scoping reviews, um, what they are and how to do them. So I have a presentation to help guide um, our discussion today. I'm going to turn off my video just for bandwidth. Um, so I will be asking you to uh, also add some comments to the chat as we go. So um, you'll see a little icon with a thinking man uh, with a question mark. So just keep an eye out for those and be ready to uh, put your thoughts in the chat box, please. Um, am I, there we go. So our objectives today are to describe and explain scoping reviews, what they are and why to do them to describe the steps to follow when completing a scoping review. And I will use an example of a recent scoping review I did as part of my PhD. Um, some common questions around doing scoping reviews, and then we can have questions and answers. So uh, what are scoping reviews? Well, here are two uh, definitions that are similar but different, so that we could look at them. Um, so first, explanatory projects that systematically map the literature available on a topic, identifying key concepts, theories, sources of evidence, and gaps in the research. And that's from the Canadian Institute of Health Research. Um, and then a paper um, published in 2014, the, the definition was a scoping review or scoping study is a form of knowledge synthesis that addresses an explanatory research question aimed at mapping key concepts, types of evidence, and gaps in research related to a defined area or field by systematically searching, selecting, and synthesizing existing knowledge. So you can see that there are some common words, um, explanatory, um, mapping, um, systematic or systematically, gaps in research. These are things that scoping reviews um, are, are, are doing. Um, so just to ask, um, what, um, what are some of the differences between scoping reviews and systematic reviews? I know there was a brief introduction of the different types of reviews in the first webinar, but maybe people can just pop in some thoughts into the chat. Great, a precursor to systematic reviews. Yes, scoping reviews are often happen before a systematic review. Scoping reviews are broader. Any other thoughts? S systematic reviews are more time intensive than scoping reviews. Interesting. Uh, scoping reviews, there's no meta-analysis required. It's true. We'll come back to the time at the end. Um, uh, scoping review is done when there is little vague evidence in the field that you're working on. That, that is true. Um, great. Thanks for those thoughts. Um, so here's just a table um, that addresses some of the thoughts I had around the differences. So systematic reviews are often more focused, um, have a defined um, kind of criteria, that cannot change throughout the process. It's typically quantitative um, uh, with that meta-analysis. 
Um, the purpose is to have detailed data extraction or knowledge accumulation. And the typical type of question is, what is the effectiveness of something compared to something else in XXX patients? So that's sort of what you would often see with the systematic review. Uh, scoping reviews are often broad and explanatory. They are flexible and um, areas of criteria can be changed um, as you go, as long as you're transparent about it. Uh, the synthesis is typically qualitative um, and uh, the purpose is to identify perimeters and gaps in the literature by mapping knowledge. So a kind of typical question would be what is known about a certain topic in the literature. Um, great, thank you for, for these, these uh, additional thoughts in the chat. So why, why would you do a scoping review? Um, I think we've answered some of these already, uh, a precursor to uh, a systematic review, um, trying to understand what's in the um, literature, if there's little evidence on something. Any other thoughts on why you would do a, a scoping review? Evidence mapping, yep. Hypothesis generation, thanks, Nina. A gap analysis, great. Let's look at some of the, the thoughts. So um, kind of the first uh, article that really summarized the how to do a, a scoping review was published in 2005 by Arsky and O'Malley. So oftentimes you'll see Arsky and O'Malley referenced in a, a scoping review. Um, and the, based on that paper, there are four main reasons to do a scoping review. Uh, the first is to examine the extent the range and the nature of available research on a topic or question. The second reason would be to determine the value of undertaking a full systematic review, both of these things we've mentioned. The third is to summarize and disseminate research findings across a body of research uh, evidence. Uh, and that can be um, heterogeneous or it can be complex. And then the last reason would be to identify research gaps in the literature to aid planning and commissioning future research, for example, or policy change or planning. So there was a scoping review on conducting and reporting of scoping reviews conducted in 2000, and, well, published in 2016. Um, and what they saw across almost 500 scoping reviews was kind of different common reasons the most being to explore the breadth or extent of evidence and to map and summarize the evidence. Um, also was to inform future research. And I think linked to that is the identifying the knowledge gaps and addressing the gaps. Um, I thought it's interesting that there were only 8% of these almost 500 studies that were done to, for implications for practice and policy. Um, and you can see also advancing knowledge, identifying themes and developing a conceptual framework. So just some interesting thoughts on how, how, how others have been doing scoping reviews or why they're doing them. Uh, so the benefit of a scoping review is that um, it allows for flexibility to explore different types of studies as well as revise criteria after testing or as you're going. Um, it facilitates a mapping and a synthesis of available evidence. And this can be when a body of literature has not been comprehensively reviewed, um, or it exhibits a large, complex, heterogeneous nature. And so I think there's a thought that, you know, you only can do scoping reviews if there's, uh, if there's little evidence on something, but it can also be used as a scoping review can be used to examine what we know in large, complex, uh, you know, literature as well. And then it also helps to clarify working definitions and conceptual boundaries of a topic. So you can kind of get a breadth of what people are, are um, how they're understanding a concept, for example. So how to do a scoping review. So this is kind of the meat for those, uh, I think it's almost 72% of those who did the Medimedia want to learn how to do a scoping review. Um, I thought it would be helpful for me to um, share my example. So I'll go through kind of the broad methods and history of, of the scoping review frameworks. 
Uh, and then I'll take us through each kind of stage of, of scoping reviews and I'll, I'll use my example to, to kind of illustrate um, how to do it. So, um, methods, as I mentioned, were originally developed by Arsky and O'Malley in 2005, and then they were expanded by Livek and all in 2010. The Joanna Briggs Institute um, started doing guidance in 2015 on scoping reviews, um, and that's been updated recently. And the PRISM extension for scoping review was published in 2018. Um, and then there are quite a lot of other resources. Um, I mean, there's a whole scoping review network on the Joanna Briggs Institute website. So there's a lot of resources to help guide you in the process. I think it's interesting to also think about the frameworks for scoping reviews has also kind of grown and expanded over time to help uh, researchers and um, uh, academics navigate how to do scoping reviews. So Arsky and Mali had these six initial stages, like they're called stages of doing a scoping review. So identifying the question, identifying relative, re relevant studies, study selection, and charting the data, collating, summarizing, and reporting the results, and then an option of consultation. Levick to those six stages. But what they did was they expanded the understanding of what those stages were. So, you know, not just identifying the research question, but being very clear about what that means. Uh, you know, so clarifying and linking the purpose of the research question. Um, identifying relevant studies or balancing feasibility with breadth and comprehensiveness of the scoping review, study selection, using an iterative team approach to select studies and extract data, charting the data, incorporating a numerical summary and quanti qualitative thematic analysis. So really expanding it to include both the kind of the quantitative and quality, uh, qualitative elements. The collating, summarizing and reporting the results um, would be the, you know, the write-up, the identifying the implications of the study, findings for policy, practice, or research, and then the consultation process, you know, um, what's uh, it, making it more of a required approach for a scoping review. The Joanna Briggs Institute uh, further expanded six stages and kind of, I think, would rather, I would call these steps, rather, um, and I've also seen um, the Joanna Briggs uh, stages here, these nine stages, um, even fleshed out further to even more steps. So, but it's the same notion of what you do. Uh, and I'm gonna take us through that. Um, and I'm gonna stick with six stages because when I started doing my scoping review, we conceptualized it in like 2007, end of 2017 and really 2018. And the, the PRISM guidelines were not yet published. The updated Joanna Briggs Institute guidelines were not yet published. Um, and so I was wanting to work off kind of this initial stages. So the, the, the kind of more expanded Levick ones, but the Arsky and O'Malley. And I think there are lots of steps within it. So you can see how um, how one can understand doing a scoping review. But again, just to say there are different, um, different guidance and at the end of the day, they're all proposing the same type of steps. Um, it's just how, many, how much you parse it out, I suppose. So doing a scoping review, um, this was a scoping review that was done for my PhD. Um, and we, we published a protocol uh, paper in 2019, December, and then the paper results paper was published in March, 2021. So the focus of, of my scoping review um, with this amazing team, we, we partnered with colleagues at Makarere University, um, was looking at the implementation of maternal and perinatal death reviews. And so I'm gonna take us through that example after presenting each stage. The first stage is to identify the research question. So as with any research, you're gonna to wanna to start with what is your question? And being very clear in terms of defining what that question is, and it should be combining both kind of a broad question, but also a specific context of inquiry. 
you do want to have a narrow idea of what you're looking at. Otherwise, you know, you, you would be looking at too much. So having a, a very specific context of inquiry, but it has to be a broader open question. Consider the rationale for conducting this study before specifying and commenting on the purpose of the study, because that will drive uh, why you're doing the study. So being very clear on the rationale for doing the study. Um, and you may wanna stipulate the outputs of the study and, and recognizing that you can review and consider refining your questions, objectives, et cetera, after the piloting process and even the screening process as you've been exploring the literature. One recommendation that is often given, and I would support this, is to write a protocol that would be very clear in terms of predefined objectives as well as methods. And of course that can be refined as needed um, as long as you're reporting the change. A protocol doesn't have to be published as a paper, but it rather can also act as a guide to say, this is what we're setting out to do. And as you're doing it, being able to recognize where you're kind of making adjustments and then documenting those adjustments along the way. So I would definitely say this first stage is developing a protocol. So for the scoping review that was done for the, um, my PhD, um, the objective, just to kind of give a sense on, on uh, the broad question within a specific context of inquiry, was to map and syn synthesize the available literature on factors that support or hinder uh, the intervention implementation so the maternal perinatal death surveillance and response implementation in low and middle income countries using a theory-based conceptual framework. So that's quite a lot of words, <laughs> not that I read it out loud, but it's being clear in terms of what we're gonna be doing, which is to map and to synthesize the available literature, it's open in terms of what the available literature is. The, the specific con, you know, con, uh, inquiry is the factors that support or hinder implementation. That's what we're gonna be looking for. That's the, the concept. And then where in low and middle income countries, and then the how is using a theory-based conceptual implementation framework. So for us, doing a protocol wasn't just about writing the steps of the scoping review in the sense of uh, you know, screening and data extraction. We had to really also flesh out the how through developing a theory-based conceptual implementation framework. So I would say much of this protocol paper is actually mapping how we identified uh, a framework that we then adapted um, for the how we're going to understand um, the data. Um, and that was published in BMJ Open. The second stage is to identify rele relevant studies. So there are a couple steps within this one. So the first is to determine the eligibility criteria of the studies that you're gonna be looking for. So you wanna use this to make decisions on what papers or sources or literature you will include. Some things to think about are where or which countries, regions, subset of literature you're gonna be looking at uh, and being explicit. Uh, another thing is when. So have a clear rationale for your start and end date. You know, starting in 2004 is what we did, ending in July 2018. And we were able to justify the start date because that was the start date of the guideline uh, for the intervention that WHO released. And the end date was the date that we were basically finishing the, the protocol. We didn't want to keep on changing the end date because then you'll never stop, right? So we made a very explicit, this is the end date because this is when we're finishing the protocol. Um, and then the what is the concept you're trying to understand. And then you'll also may be want to include language. So you can add different languages or you can stipulate only English with clear rationale and limitations uh, around that. But those would be components of the eligibility criteria. And once you have your search terms, uh, based on the eligibility criteria, it's really helpful to pilot test them. You know, you use the MeSH terms and you know, you can choose one or one database, maybe two, if you're feeling like you have enough time or support with the team to pilot test different uh, kind of combinations of the, the search terms to identify, you know, are these the right ones? 
And we did this and it was quite a process to do, uh, but was really grateful because as you can imagine for maternal and newborn health, there are many different types of terms. And so if we had just put in delivery, uh, you know, in terms of delivery care or childbirth care delivery, we would have gotten so many. So being able to limit what your search terms are according to what you're trying to understand or what you're trying to extract. Um, next step would be once you have um, your criteria and uh, you're very clear on what your search terms are going to be, um, you want to start searching for the studies. This is identifying studies, right, the stage. So you would search different databases um, and the search strategy would be comprehensive as you just discussed all the different criteria um, that you'll want to be clear on. Another way to identify studies in a scoping review is to look at the reference list. So you may have one or two really clear, you know, very important articles relating to your topic. Um, so then I would take those papers at first and then go through the reference list. As you go though, and I found this with my study as well, um, even towards the end when we were doing data extraction, I realized that there were some really key papers that we had missed in that this other process of looking at databases and reference lists before in consultations. We were able to add them in because we found them in papers as we were doing the data extraction. So, so you can always add in through the reference lists as you're going, as long as you're transparent about when you did that. Another way to find studies is through gray literature. Um, if it's applicable to your the study purpose and the review or the question or objectives, you can include unpublished literature or gray literature into your search strategy. Um, this can be done through online searches. So, you know, Google uh, or specific websites. So, for example, there are a lot of reports, as I'm sure you all know, in health. So one thing that we did was we looked at the WHO um, uh, kind of library and we had this use the same mesh terms and we found a lot of really, really relevant uh, regional and country reports on the topic. Um, and uh, also looked at other websites that I know are very, uh, have a host a lot of resources on maternal and newborn health using the same mesh terms and searched it. I think it's all about being systematic also in your process. Um, and then the last, if it's appropriate, is to use the consultation process to ask key stakeholders for studies or share a list of the studies you've identified and ask them to have a quick look to see if they know that any are really missing. So once you have identified all your studies, um, the, the best way I would say, I used EndNote, I know others have used Mendeley, but if you're able to use an electronic referencing database, it makes all the difference to be able to compile all of this information because you're gonna have perhaps thousands and thousands of studies and you, you can't manage that necessarily on your own in Excel. So being able to use a referencing database allows you to pull them all together um, and, and, uh, and it also allows you to see it by different source of where you've identified the studies and then you can remove duplicates as you're gonna go. Um, so just to kind of, a, I, I would say a tip or uh, something that you may want to consider is using electronic referencing um, to identify the, like to, once you identify them, to pull them together. So well, as I mentioned, our experience was, uh, I, I think I took us through uh, what our search process was, but, you know, I think this kind of table was in our um, our protocol or our final paper, I can't remember, both tables were actually, but it just is a nice way to be very clear on what you've done. So your review parameters in terms of years or time points, the setting, the language, the topic, what search terms you used, what search engines you used. And so you can see we used multiple search engines uh, and we listed the different gray literature search engines and then what consultation uh, was was um, undertaken as part of the search process. And just to flesh it out a bit more for the concept part, which is, is this, you know, the implementation of maternal and perinatal death audit, it's quite a complex um, intervention. So we, we tried to make it very clear what our search terms were and had this kind of concept table 
which helped really identify how we got to those search terms. Next step is the study selection. So if you're using an electronic database um, system like EndNote or Mendeley, it's really easy to remove the duplicates um, because sometimes the different databases extract the information differently. So it has like the first name of the author and then the surname of the author, whereas others will be the surname and their initial. So the software allows you to more easily do that because it's able to track multiple um, factors or um, Yes, components of that reference. After you've removed all the duplicates, you first screen the titles and the abstracts of the identified sources. Now you can do this, we did it as a two-step process where we first screened all the titles. And then after we had removed non-relevant titles, for example, it might, it might indicate which country it is and the country was high income, we removed it, right? So you can just actually do the titles first. And then we did the abstracts. Ideally, it should be more than one person doing the screening um, independently. And you can have a third party who is uh, uh, resolving any differences. So that's the ideal, but it's not always feasible. So it's not necessarily a requirement, but if you're, if you're not doing a independent screening with others, then you need to have other mitigation uh, efforts in place to make sure that you're, you're clear on what you're doing. So perhaps reviewing a hundred titles with your supervisor. So that way it's very clear that you know, how, it, kind of that there's agreement between you and other authors about uh, what you're looking for and being very clear on it. Um, the next level of screening, level two, according to this stage, is um, the screening of the full text. So once you've identified, you've gotten rid of all the, the non-relevant abstracts, then you're going to be looking at all the papers that perhaps could be relevant, and then you look at their full text. Again, ideally, this is done by two or more reviewers independently. So what we did was we had two reviewers independently screen the titles. I think I said that already. Then the abstracts, then the full text. Um, and in the cases where abstracts were not available, so for example, some of the reports did not have executive summaries or abstracts, we had to review the full, full text. And the discrepancies were, um, were resolved by a third party. So there were three of us who were doing most of this work. And we divided it up so we were doing independent screening of, of, of each, each reference had two different people independently screening. And where there was a discrepancy, that third person was the one that resolved the difference. And to help real, to really help us in that process, we met regularly during the screening process to discuss selection of articles and to revise the screening if needed, because there was a lot of kind of questions about, well, what is the concept that we're trying to capture? Is that implementation or is it, is it not? So by having these regular, we met every Friday for, for 30 minutes just to touch base and that also helped keep us on track. So that was really helpful. Um, and then just to show you the flow chart, as I'm sure you know, scoping reviews, as most reviews, they have these helpful flow charts which really identify that process of identifying the articles or identifying the, the relevant studies. Um, and you can see how that would go in terms of, um, we searched through multiple databases and found 2009 references. We went on online and we found uh, 95 references. We removed the duplicates. We screened the titles and removed non-relevant ones, we screen the abstracts, remove non-relevant ones, we screen the full text. And at this stage is where we add in other, rec other records that were either identified by consultation or by reference check. And then from there, we reviewed the full text and identified 72 relevant studies. And you can see there are different types. And in the paper, the final paper, we also recorded the number of search items found at the different search engines. And I think it's really important to just be very transparent in how you found all of the information. So the fourth stage is data collection. So it's often called charting uh, in, in scoping reviews. And charting can also be data extraction, if you will. So it's helpful to have a charting form where you develop 
uh, the data collection instrument to keep the records of the characteristics of the included studies um, and the key information relevant to the question. And then you can revise as needed. So, you know, we pilot tested this, we um, uh, made revisions as we were going to make it clearer. But having a very clear instrument does help. And then to extract the data. So going in and charting the data. So every full text screening, your full text you're going through and you're extracting the information that's put into the charting form. Um, and I'll show you a picture now of the Excel that we had, which was quite monstrous. Um, but ideally, this is done by two or more reviewers independently um, so that they are, that you can check each other for their work. Um, in our experience, as I mentioned, we pilot tested the data extraction tool using three articles. So the we actually had a workshop uh, here in Cape Town where we uh, pilot tested the, the tool and we refined it together. Um, and uh, we did not have multiple people screening the same article or not screening, extracting data from the same article. Our, our charting form was very comprehensive and we had 72 articles. It, there was no possible way we were gonna get through it even with three people working on this. Um, so what we did was again, we engaged in weekly meetings to discuss issues or questions relating to the extraction process. So we really did an important kind of piloting at the front and spent a lot of time on the piloting. So we all were on the same page on how we were doing this. Um, I see there are some questions coming through and I'm just gonna go through and then we can pause and take questions at the end, but please keep them coming and then we can come back up to them. So I'm just showing you the, the charting tool that we used, which was in Excel. Um, and as you can see, we had, um, I mean, it was, it was very, very lengthy across um, uh, many different uh, uh, areas where we were extracting information. Um, and the, the tool was comprehensive in that it had different tabs. So the first tab was explaining the tool itself and what we were doing and what each of the different um, elements were. Um, and then we also had, um, codes uh, for aggregating different elements of the tool. And we had our framework that we're using, the country groups that helped identify for us which grouping the country was in um, and, and kept track of our extraction pilots. So that way we could see the changes over time um, as well as the framework itself, which also evolved over time. So this was quite a comprehensive process, but I mean, other scoping reviews that I've, I've been engaged with or I've reviewed papers, Oftentimes the charting tool is quite lengthy in terms of a lot of different things that you're extracting. Um, um, and just being organized is gonna be really important to uh, making sure that you're keeping track of any changes, um, but that it's also very clear for sorting later when you want to do the analysis. Um, so the data summary and synthesis of results is the fifth stage. And uh, for this stage, we collate and summarize the report results. So this is kind of writing it up. Um, but in order to, to do that, you need to do the analysis. So the one part of the analysis is the basic numerical analysis to show the extent, nature, and distribution of studies, which is often done in Excel. So it's a count, you know, how many studies are coming from Sub-Saharan Africa, how many are coming from Southeast Asia, how many are, um, uh, you know, um, have, uh, I'm trying to think of, uh, how many were on maternal death audits, how many were on perinatal death audits, you know, you can have lots of different things that you're calculating, um, and, you know, how many were during this, the first five years, next five years, just to show time points. Of, of when the studies are being published. So you're gonna decide what your analyses will be to extract that information. And then the qualitative content or thematic analysis. And as I mentioned, we used our framework to do that. And you can use diagrams and tables uh, to, to present the information. A flow chart is something that's really important to include, um, but also you know, tables that show the synthesis of the information according to the thematic analysis. But also it's really important that any sort of synthesis of the results looks at the research and practical implications of your findings. Um, because we wanna be, wanna make sure that our study is, is linking back to the relevance of why we've done it 
And it's not just about wanting to do necessarily first future research. I mean, that's one part of it. We also wanna be able to inform practice um, if it's relevant. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, our experience was we, we did both of these types of approaches um, with reference characteristics. And then we had our, our conceptual framework, which was also very comprehensive with 24 constructs. And the last stage, before I'll pause for questions, is um, to be clear for, for consultation, some say it's optional, some say you should do it. I think you need to know why you're doing it if you're gonna do it. And, and I think that the general feel is that you should do some sort of consultation. That's the current um, you know, uh, guidelines. Um, but then you need to know the purpose of why you're doing the consultation and identify based on that person per purpose, who should be consulted, you know? Consider your audience, consider the key stakeholders linked to the topic, consider your capacity to engage. You may not be able to attend a bunch of, you know, uh, ministerial meetings in order to um, get inputs on your scoping review, um, but you, you may have specific contacts who are experts in the field and you may wanna seek their guidance. So, so thinking about your capacity is also really important. And then determine what engagement you want from them. Do you want them to review the question, the scope and the criteria at the beginning? Do you want them to perhaps look at your literature or your identified studies and contribute to that? Um, do you want them to review the findings to support interpretation? It's gonna depend again on the purpose of the consultation. We had really extensive consultation for our scoping review because what we did was um, the work was also linked to different um, work plans of uh, the World Health Organization technical working group on the intervention. Um, and it was also part of the work plan for a project that we're doing at the School of Public Health called the Countdown to 2030 Drivers Group. So we actually put the scoping review into their work plan. So that way it was also being monitored and followed by them because we wanted the scoping review to also influence what they were doing um, and, and uh, findings that were gonna be linked to you know, the things that they're gonna be doing in the future in terms of WHO guidelines, for example. So we engage them in all aspects of the process from presenting the, conceptual, the conceptual idea to requesting gray literature, to sharing preliminary results and presenting final results. The benefit of this is, is that uh, WHO is releasing um, materials to support this implementa implementation of this intervention. And uh, they actually launched them last month. They're not yet online because they're still going through WHO process. Um, but we have a whole chapter in that, in that guideline that focuses on one element of uh, this scoping review. So we were able to input into that uh, guideline in order to help inform implementation, which is really fantastic, but it was a lot of work and required a lot of time. Just in summary, scoping reviews are conducted to map literature available on a topic in a systematic way. So I think systematic is important. And then scoping reviews are useful when an area of research is new, or emerging or heterogeneous and or complex. So basically it's useful if it's, if it's relevant to what you're trying to do. So I'm gonna, before we go into some of the common questions that I've received, I see that there are some questions here and I just thought maybe we should answer some of them first before we go into some of the other common questions. Um, so I say, see that, uh, Lamisa, you say, do we need to add or keep track of articles reviewed and included from reference list into the PRISMA guidelines? So he's gonna take us through the, the PRISMA guidelines for scoping review. Um, um, but as you saw, I, we, we, we did include that. Um, then I see, what is the significance of time frame? Ah. <laughs> Uh, so while doing searching in the database. So what do you, what do you mean time frame in terms of, um, yes, like that would be one of the criteria that you would have, as I mentioned. I hope that's answering your question. I think it's important that you know what your start date is and what your cutoff date is, and then looking within that range of time. Otherwise, you're really opening yourself up, I think, for criticism when you do want to publish, um, because it may be too open. Um, a theoretical framework can be used to map current evidence when conducting, yes, 
um, a scoping review, that is true. Um, and then you asked, is this similar to a screening tool? I, I don't know if you're referring to the charting tool. Um, was, yes. I think, yeah. 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 No, it was, it was different. So the screening tool, we had our criteria and it was also done in Excel. So what we did was we extracted all of the references from EndNote and we put them into an Excel. And, and that's how we screened the documents and kept record of it. Um, and so I had one tab that was the criteria to remind us of what the criteria was with um, a list of the low and middle income countries because we were also needing to check the country. So it was easy for people to check that. Um, and then we basically had a, I had a tab for each of the levels. So like the level for screening um, titles. And then we added one for the abstracts. Then we added one for the final, for the full text. Um, and different people were assigned to the different, um, to the different uh, studies. And then uh, we would include or exclude based on uh, the criteria. So there was a, a whole separate Excel that we used for the screening tool. Um, I okay. didn't show that, but yeah. I appreciate it. So it's it's uh, your inclusion and exclusion criteria was used as a screening tool, yeah. and um, it's a bit different. I know in systematic reviews often um, they introduce sort of a, a a screening tool, you know, in terms of in combination uh, with inclusion and exclusion criteria, and mm. also sort of in the Prisma system. But um, um, this is this clarifies it. Thank you. Okay. Good. Um, and then the request for the sources for getting data extraction templates. So the Joanna Briggs Institute has excellent resources. So um, I, there's a link in this uh, this PowerPoint, and I'm sure we can I can also send it uh, while Bee's presenting too, so you have it right here. But they've got some great examples of templates, and I think you also would want to look at the area of research that you're working on, and perhaps identify other scoping reviews in that area and see what they use to extract information as well. Um, and how many databases are sufficient for a scoping review? I don't think there's a minimum or a maximum. I think uh, you, you need to discern what is, um, you know, what is proper, you know, what, what, you're, what you're trying to do, the, the breadth of your scoping review. I mean, you definitely wanna look at, I would say more than one. Um, and the more you do, the more likely you're gonna get more studies. I mean, you saw in that um, the table how many different studies came from the different ones. Um, and and I, I don't have the table now that shows, you know, the final selection of the 72 where they came from, but they came from multiple different places. So I, I think if your purpose of the scoping review is to really map all the literature, the more databases you use, the the, the stronger your scoping review will be. You can also test the database. Like we did look at a couple of other ones and we put the mesh terms in and didn't find anything that was different. Um, so it was like, you know, 10, 10 studies identified. It was clearly not the right search engine. So you also discern that if, if, it's, if it's appropriate for the study that you're looking at. Okay. Uh, Mary, can I also just add that um, what I've been seeing is that more and more in, in journals, um, one is actually, uh, uh, reviewers are looking for around three databases, electronic databases, and at least one other source of, of search. So that could be sort of um, looking at gray literature um, in the form of thesis or um, reports on institutional websites or something like that. Um, but I think you're right in saying that it depends on how broad um, the field is and how much is published. Um, and then, of course, what you find in the individual databases. Um, sometimes if it's not, if it's a, a, a social science topic within the field of public health, for example, you may want to, to search beyond just PubMed. You may want to search in PsycInfo or other social science databases to find the additional literature. Um, I, I see this other question about if we find something interesting apart from our outcome of interest, can we include it in the scoping review deviating from the protocol? So that's actually one of the questions, common questions that I 
that we have. Um, and we're going to come to it. So I'm going to answer it just now. Let's carry on. So these are some of the common questions. Mary, um, sorry, before you carry on, I think in the beginning you skipped one question. Um, and the it was really a question. No, it was the question about is there a uh, crossover between qualitative evidence synthesis and scoping reviews? Um, sorry, I didn't that. Go ahead. Yeah, it was uh, right at the top. Um, so I mean, I can I can start to try and address that. Um, so those are two different reviews and they address um, usually two different questions. Um, but where this uh, overlap or intersection could be where a scoping review, for example, looks at a broad um, topic area um, and then informs um, qualitative evidence synthesis review questions. So it could be that the scoping review is then there in, in, in its purpose is really a precursor to you then going on to do um, a QES. What you may discover from your scoping review on a particular topic is that you may find that there's a lot of qualitative research, for example, done in that area, and that can then help you narrow and define um, your QES question better. That's really where the overlap is. Um, one of the questions that um, I often get is whether um, if you start off doing a scoping review, if you can convert that into a QES. Um, and I usually say that the answer is no, because the way that you wrote your protocol, the way that you wrote your eligibility criteria, the way you phrased your question, um, how you developed your methods, was for scoping review. So you can't want to then apply that to a QES. So it's generally encouraged that you complete the scoping review um, and you use it to inspire you or, or refine questions that could be answered in a QES, which you then do as a separate um, review. So that's basically doing two reviews and um, your QES as a result is going to be a, a QES that is really well informed um, compared to a, maybe a QES where you go ahead and just do the QES without having done any sort of mapping of the evidence um, before. Yeah, so that's um, what I had with regards to that. Um, Mary, I'm not sure with regards to your example, whether you found that there was um, a difference in, in, in balance, um, just in terms of where you felt um, you were maybe overstepping and going into sort of a QES um, um, rather than your intended scoping review. Yeah, I mean, I think we, you know, we didn't have quality criteria, right? So um, we weren't. It, it's also we didn't feel that there was any overstepping. It didn't. It wasn't relevant for us, I don't think. Um, and yeah, and I think for uh, to the question on like the changing things with the scoping review. You know, as long as it's within the remit of a scoping review, you can go and change you know, criteria, but I, and, and processes as well, um, and deviate from the protocol, as long as you explain, you know, why you did, you know, or that, or that you did, just that you're documenting that you did. But I think if you want to change your outcome of interest, that's actually changing in part your question. So, so just, you have to be careful that when you change an outcome of your interest, then, you know, what, what, how does that affect your question? And that may change what you're trying to achieve in terms of a type of review. Um, so I just would, I think that you can make changes, but you should just be clear that the question is still appropriate for a scoping review and not a different type of review. Um, and, and the question on is Google Scholar the best for great literature searches? I don't know if I, I, I can't speak to whether what is best or not. For Google Scholar, I don't think you can, I, Others might know um, if you can extract from Google Scholar, like you can extract from the online search engines. I don't, I did not. What we did is we had very clear criteria. So we searched the mesh terms on Google Scholar and then we searched the first, I think, 15 pages of, of um, you know, like you, you can like look at the next page, next page of, of um, literature. And we, to see if there were any new studies that hadn't been identified through the search engines. So we, we were very clear on that process and it was like that specific process to the gray literature search of Google Scholar that was mentioned in our appendices, you know, our supplementary online files. 
So I think as long as you have a systematic approach to how you do it, um, it's, it's still appropriate for a scoping review. Uh, whether Google Scholar is best or not, I'm not sure. I, I even just used Google. Like we, we literally looked at just Google because I actually found that there were quite relevant reports that were published by USAID or DFID who, which wouldn't be on Google Scholar anyways. Mm -hmm. um, so we also did a separate process for Google. Yeah, I agree with you, Mary. I think it's it's useful to, to search on Google. You may search Google Scholar. Um, I think it's just one of the options. It's not necessarily the best option. Um, and I mean, I think the articles that you uh, would find in the databases that you selected to search may still appear on Google Scholar. So in some ways there's repetition, but in other ways you may find maybe any kind of additional articles published in other databases that you didn't include to search in your, in your review. Um, but I also just recommend actually searching Google and specifying upfront that that you'll search Google, that you'll contact experts, that, you know, other methods of of doing it. So this is not necessarily the best method, just an option amongst many. Great, thanks Dee. So I'm gonna take us through just a couple of common questions that I've received. Um, the first one is, uh, do you need to have multiple people screen and chart data? Just pop your answer into the chat. another second in case anyone else yes yes depends yes yes everyone's saying yes the answer is it depends <laughs> i think it depends on which guideline you're using as long as you're clear um and if you as i mentioned if you only have one person screening and charting data this is the depends but you you still need a systematic process to check the work that that person is doing by other authors so that's that's what my answer would be. I don't know, B, if maybe it's different now with the PRISM um, guidelines on scoping review, but um, I think what's really important is that you have um, a process that is checking the work if you aren't going to mm -hmm. be able to do two um, yeah. or more. Yeah, I agree. I think there needs to be some sort of quality check. And even if that's in the form of you having um, obviously your spreadsheet or your your organizational tool, whatever, however you're going to organize the charting um, and having in the context of, uh, of let's say postgraduate studies, having your supervisor check that just for them to be able to ask some questions around how you, how you did it. Um, but also asking if you have other authors just to check, even if it's checking a sample like 10% of your charting and not um, doing it in duplicate as in them doing it um, as well. Um, but yeah, try and have some, some process of systematically documenting how you're doing it and then having some sort of quality check of what you're doing. Great. Thank you, um, So can you change the search criteria after you publish a protocol? I think I answered this one just now as well. I think it's as long as you have a very clear rationale for why you made the change, and then just being able to document it for the results paper. Um, exactly, you need to justify it. Um, and, and just documenting that change. So what, one thing that we did was like for the framework, which changed a lot, or the charting tool, which changed a lot because the framework was changing. We had multiple versions of it um, so we were able to very clearly track change, like change, like monitor the changing that was happening. Uh, and that that became a table. So I ended up making a table that became a supplementary file that was like the original framework. And then in the original charting tool was like kind of the first column. And then it was like change one, change two, change three. And it wasn't the whole thing. It was just more of a summary of what changes took place and why. So I think as long as you're justifying it, and when doing a scoping review, should you plan to conduct the meta-analysis? Okay. 
Got some two no's. Three. Yeah. It depends. Well, I'm glad that B's here because we can also answer it. <laughs> but I would say no, because scoping reviews are a descriptive study design and intended to chart and map the available data. Whereas systematic reviews summarize the effect or effect size across multiple studies through meta analyses. So mm -hmm. I don't know, B, if you know of any scoping reviews that also conduct meta analyses. I did not. No, no. And actually, one of the, the things that also make it um, really difficult if you, if you attempted to, <laughs> which hasn't really been done from what I've seen, is, um, is that the studies are generally very different. I mean, with scoping mm -hmm. reviews, you, you generally want to include um, a wide range of, for example, study designs, both qualitative and quantitative studies, and sometimes mixed method studies. So by default of the study designs being different, it kind of really makes it then difficult to um, develop a meta-analysis, um, in addition to the fact that you're, of course, not looking at effectiveness. Um, so you can't really have that clear uh, um, response of something works or doesn't work, um, like with intervention um, reviews. Great. Thanks, Steve. Um, do scoping reviews take a long time? Katie says, yes, they do take long. <laughs> She's in the middle of doing one. <laughs> Same time as a systematic review, 12 months. Depends on the question. That's true. It definitely depends on the question. And it depends on your team. It it's not moving now, but it depends on a lot of factors. I really, I, I feel like I, I, saw, I saw one video on scoping reviews when I first started it said, it takes one, if one researcher is working full time, it should take three months. I mean, that, I, I don't even know what the kind of question would be able to be done in three months with one person doing it. I suppose it's the breadth of the study, um, how many people are involved, how many papers do you find? I mean, to fully, to fully extract data for 72 articles was a huge job for us. And perhaps there are other scoping reviews even more, you know, I think um, I saw one paper, it was like over 600, you know, the scoping review of scoping reviews, 500 papers almost. So, so that, that can take a long time, even if you do have a strong team. To give you a sense of, um, of how long it took us, as I said, we started, we really conceptualized and we presented the idea to one of the technical working groups in January 2018. We finished, the paper was published in March 2021, right? So that's, um, that's a three year span that it happened. And you can see that the process, I mean, when I presented that in January in 2018 to this technical working group, I said it would be done in six months. So I think we, <laughs> I think I think my supervisor also was like, yeah, that's not going to happen in six months. She knew because she's done this before, um, and I do think the comment here about it could be a, a good, you know, master's uh, or honors research project. Um, it, it definitely can be, and I know a lot of um, uh, postgraduates who do it as part of as their study. Um, I think it also then links to what the breadth and the scope of the study is going to be, what the question is going to be. It has to be answerable. And, and kind of perhaps even more narrow um, than, than what a, a big broad one would be or using a large framework would be. Um, and I, I was surprised, I'll be honest, looking at this and reflecting on it, how long, um, how long the, the data, ex like kind of like this, the screening process took a long time just because we were, um, you know, we were changing the criteria actually up until then, right? So it was like, I thought we would start screening, you know, come April, but even just to develop the protocol and build our team, it took six months. The screening process took six months. Um, the extraction of the data took six months. Um, but mm -hmm. e even then we actually, the data analysis and writing results, I mean, this was over a year. Mind you, COVID happened in this time. So there was, you know, months at home working with kids, small kids, et cetera. But part of that, I would say, it's almost like a data analysis and writing results. We went back to the data extraction. 
and I, I, I mean, we were going back and checking the work that others did and getting more information from the papers itself. So that part was actually quite circular, if you will, going back to the extraction and going back to the papers uh, in order to do the analysis. And, and that's, I think, the qualitative component of really trying to understand what was in it. Um, and the protocol uh, was, was published fast. It was published in BMJ Open. It didn't take long. And, and the, the HPP paper, Health Policy and Planning, it took six months from submission to publication. Mm. So it wasn't the publication part that took long. It was just the whole process for me that took long. But I, I think it does depend a lot on a lot of factors in terms of um, how long it takes. Mm. I Am think I also, um, Mary, going? just to add with, with that, um, in terms of the discussion around using this for postgraduate study research projects, I think um, maybe the objectives as well when you're working as a researcher are different than when you are doing your postgraduate studies. I think there is potential to do, for example, a scoping review where the student is expected to demonstrate the kind of the, the steps in doing a review. And maybe it's not to the standard where something can be published. So you can take kind of, um, the approach of doing um, very minimal at each of the steps. So for example, with the searching where one just searches one database and that's just to, for the student to learn how to develop a search strategy and then do the searches. So you're not searching, for example, the minimum required three databases that some journals expect in order to publish with them. Um, so there are things like that where I guess one can take shortcuts for the purposes of a, a research project but um, it's almost kind of doing that, knowing then as the supervisor that your student may not be able to actually then publish that review. Um, it's quite difficult actually, I think, to, to, to publish reviews, um, just because I think they, they are not, for a very long time, they weren't of course considered very high on the, on the evidence um, grid because they are not primary research. Um, but now to actually publish a good uh, a review, it really has to be a good one with all the rigor and systematic processes um, and, with, and with the check boxes, which I'll talk to about um, soon. Um, um, so, so for you to be able to see actually what is required when you, when you want to report and publish a scoping review. Over to you, Mary. Thanks, Bea. Um, yeah, so just this is my last slide. It's just some top tips that I was thinking about. So the first one is that there are great, like lots of great guidance documents. Joanna Briggs um, Institute has a lot, the PRISM scoping review guidelines. It's like, that's, it's so great that there are all of these tools out to help you. So I would say, um, look at them and use them um, because it, it really is useful to look at the steps and it helps make, make your process easier. Um, as I mentioned, I think it does take time. Um, and so building that in, uh, the, the being organized, I, I have challenged me and I'm a very organized person when it comes to, you know, kind of, I, I've done a lot of quantitative, you know, data analyses, et cetera, in my, in my past. And so I felt like I can do this. It was a different level of type of organizing. It was almost, you had to be very, um, pedantic about every capturing every change along the way. So I ended up, I had one notebook where I, I kept my handwritten notes as I was going. Um, we kept very um, systematic documentation of all of our meetings. So we had a, like a Google doc where we also like put in decisions that were made as we were going. So it was just being very organized and at the start because then I had to go back to the screening tool that I told you about and I found like they weren't numbers weren't lining up and stuff and so I think others probably can speak to how it can be overwhelming when you're dealing with a lot of information and so being organized is really important and then um, I think this we're better together don't try to do it alone I mean obviously if you're a, a, a honors or master's student and this is your first review you're going to need to lean on to your um, um, supervisors as this is a new perhaps a new area um, of work um, but I think for, for me it was so useful to have a team to work with um, uh, being able to, to bounce off ideas and and the team that we worked with it was two other PhD students who were doing their research very similar topics 
that I was doing on and it and it was nice to be able to partner with another African Institute that we were able to build it into we were very fortunate because we built it into the work plans of the countdown project we were able to also support some of their time so I think also that's something to the some of the uh, professors and, and lecturers and supervisors on the, the call or on the, and during this meeting now is, you know, seeing, being able to identify even some small resources to support people's time to help um, can really reap a, a really big reward in terms of getting that work done uh, and improving the quality of it. Um, so that's, that's all for me. We've already answered quite a lot of questions and I want to make sure we have time for B. Um, present for some guidelines and um, I don't know if, if we should take any more questions now B or pass it on to you now. Um, I think we can take questions at the end. There may be some more questions coming up, um, ex uh, especially sort of around the reporting and the publishing. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Really great discussion. Okay, so um, Mary um, took us through the methods and I just thought that I would add to that presentation by sharing a little bit around um, sort of the reporting guidelines that are out there um, for scoping reviews and also where you can publish um, scoping review protocols and the actual um, manuscript. Um, so um, Prisma, as uh, Mary has, has spoken about, um, especially the extended version for scoping reviews, um, is, a re is a reporting guideline um, that outlines the minimum set of icons, uh, items that you need to include um, when you are writing your research report. And this is just for the purposes of um, increasing transparency around how you did your review, were you rigorous enough, was it systematic enough, does it sort of meet specific standards, and also to promote um, the uptake of the findings. Um, I think when, when people really in, um, consider these um, reporting guidelines, it really helps other, uh, whether it's other researchers, other um, um, uh, the audience that you're targeting your scoping review towards to see um, how you came to your findings. And, and that obviously, if, if, they, if it was done properly, promotes um, their willingness to sort of use your, your scoping review results. So um, PRISMA, which is the preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analysis extension for scoping reviews, um, Checklist um, is a, a, a general checklist um, that consists of um, several items on there. Um, some are optional, um, but most are required, especially um, for publishing. Um, so for example, in with clinical trials, there's generally a requirement that a clinical trial needs to be registered um, and there needs to be a registration number. There are certain, there are certain reporting um, standards for clinical trials as well. And this is um, the, the version for scoping reviews. Um, so usually when you are submitting to a journal for publication, um, they will ask you also to complete this PRISMA checklist, um, indicating exactly where in your manuscript you have um, done the things that are in the, in the checklist. So um, the first thing is, is quite simple, that you need to have a, a, a title and that it needs to be clearly identifiable in the manuscript. Um, and then, of course, that you have to have a structured um, summary, so an abstract, um, where they specifically ask for certain things. Um, so they'll ask you to have the background in their objectives, um, where you also summarize the eligibility criteria. And this includes saying, um, exactly where you'll search, what study designs, um, what geographic restrictions or language restrictions um, or date restrictions that you will apply in actually conducting the search, um, and then where you will conduct the search or where you'll find um, a, a evidence or, or research in addition to sort of um, electronic databases, etc. And then the methods for charting. And under the methods for charting, it's, there's usually an expectation for you to specify whether it's going to be one or two people charting um, and then results and conclusion um, that relate to the review question and objectives. 
So in the introduction, um, the biggest thing in the introduction of reviews is actually the rationale for why you are doing the review. Um, reviews in themselves, all, all types of reviews, have the common goal to um, avoid duplication of research and to reduce research waste. Um, and as a result, it's really good for you to justify why you're doing the scoping review. So if another scoping review has been done, why are you doing this? Are you doing it to update it because you feel like there's new um, research out there that you want to sort of scope um, or, or what is the purpose for actually doing um, your review? Um, and then also uh, providing, um, sorry, I'm trying to get rid of this. Um, sorry. Then also um, providing a statement about um, the question and the objectives that you're trying to address. Um, this is of course in, in terms of what who the population is, any concepts or the context or related to the question that you're trying to address. Um, and just yeah, just being able to provide some key elements that um, relate to the question. Um, in terms of the protocol, um, uh, usually you'd want to uh, have a protocol. Um, ideally, you'd want to have drafted a protocol. Um, this can be published or not. Um, so it's not always a requirement that your protocol has to be published but it's generally encouraged that there is a protocol available. And sometimes, um, so for systematic reviews, for example, uh, Prospero is one place where you can register the protocol. Unfortunately, there isn't really a clear place where you can register scoping review protocols, um, but something like the um, open um, science framework um, is a good space for registering um, the protocol. Um, you can also put it on your institutional website, somewhere where you can provide um, a link to, um, uh, to, to your protocol. Um, in some cases as well now, when you submit to a journal, if you want to submit um, a scoping review protocol for publication, you may also then um, uh, be asked to um, whether the protocol can actually be published as a preprint. So even if it doesn't get published in the journal and they reject it, it will be um, on a preprint print, um, database made publicly available and you can um, refer to that when you do eventually write up your review. Um, then of course you need to, Mary has already spoken about this extensively in terms of the eligibility criteria. So in the checklist, you then have to indicate where all the eligibility criteria are, where you're getting um, the information or the data that you're going to collect from. So the databases and any kind of gray literature searches. Um, you also then want to um, present. So this is quite new that um, you would present present a full search um, strategy for at least one database, um, including any limits that you would have specified in your eligibility criteria. So um, what this means is that you actually now have to be able to draft your search strategy in, for example, a PubMed um, and have that um, um, preliminary search strategy um, submitted as part of your review protocol um, um, to the journal, um, but then also having that submitted when you do actually want to publish the, the actual review. Um, and then of course, um, you'd want to, to have clear screening and eligibility criteria of how you're going to um, select studies into your scoping review. You'd want to describe the charting process. So you'd want to talk about what kinds of forms or templates you're going to be using. Mary showed you an Excel spreadsheet. That, that's the kind of things you want to specify up front that you'll be using Excel or you, you will, um, you'll be um, working with teammates for quality checks. Um, you'll be ex what kind of information you'll also be extracting um, and how, how that process is, is actually going to be done. Um, and then, of course, you want to be able to list and define all the variables for which data will be sought after. I just mentioned that. Um, so you'd want to say things about um, sort of study details that you'll collect. Will you collect information about, for example, the authors? 
who funded the study, um, et cetera, and also uh, details specifically related to the particular question you have. So things like including um, the population, the context, the setting, and so on. And then you'll see here that unlike with systematic reviews, for scoping reviews, um, critical appraisal of the included sources of evidence is um, done at your own choice. This is actually where you have an option. Um, I haven't done this personally. I, have, I don't know of any colleagues who have actually done any critical appraisal when it comes to scoping reviews. It's generally a very um, challenging thing to do just because of course you're including various types of study designs and also the aspects that you are trying to address um, with your scoping review question don't necessarily um, have to have a certain level of quality for you to justify responses. The way, for example, people define a particular concept or thing is the way that they define it. And that's basically what your scoping review is trying to uncover. It's, it doesn't um, really um, matter to, to what extent um, the quality is um, in, the, in the primary studies. And then of course you, um, you then synthesize, um, have to be able to say where in the, in the manuscript or in the protocol, in the manuscript um, specifically, sorry, you have, to, um, you, you have to synthesize where you've synthesized the results in terms of how you've summarized the data and presenting it um, as, as the results. Um, so for the results in scoping reviews, like in systematic reviews, you want to say, um, this is really where things like the Prisma flow chart become important. You want to say the number of sources that you've screened, um, the, the how you, at each stage at the different levels that Mary spoke about, title, abstract, and full text screening, um, how many studies were included, um, why did you exclude certain uh, studies, and then um, present this in a flow, flow diagram. So basically from when you've um, collected all your records into one space and merged them and deleted any duplicates to all the way where you have, um, uh, you've now identified the studies that you want to include in your um, review. Um, and then also um, you, you may want, uh, you may need to provide obviously in the, in, in the scoping review, um, information about um, the characteristics of the data um, and any citations where that data comes from. Um, so there's this constant need to reference back to the studies that you've included for specific findings that you've come up with in your review. Um, and then we've already spoken about critical appraisal. Um, this is um, an optional one. Um, and then the results of the individual sources of evidence. Um, so presenting the relevant data that was charted um, that respond obviously to the questions and the objectives of the review. And then also showing again um, where you synthesize the results. Um, in the discussion section, um, you are generally expected to have a summary of the evidence. This is really just a summary of what you found what the key kind of um, themes, concepts, and the types of evidence were that you found, um, limitations of the scoping review process. Um, so things like um, how many, whether you used um, at least two reviewers at, for example, with data screening or data extraction and charting, if, if, that's, um, if there was limitations in terms of maybe having quality checks in place, et cetera, this, this is where um, uh, you would have to you'd have to report this in the review, um, and then your general conclusions. Um, the conclusions are generally what the implications are for research and what the implications are for practice. And if you do a scoping review, I think I'm just thinking back to the question about the overlap between a QES and a scoping review. Um, if you find that there are, there's a need for a qualitative evidence synthesis to actually be done after you've um, done this uh, scoping review. Um, the conclusions would be uh, the right place to um, detail those sorts of, um, of, of recommendations for future research. And then, of course, the funding sources um, uh, for, for um, the included um, studies. 
um, but as well as the funding for your particular scoping review. Um, so that's usually quite important just in terms of conflicts of interest. And then here are just a few examples of um, journals um, where you can publish um, scoping review protocols and um, the actual manuscripts. So um, Open Science is um, the platform that I was talking about where you can actually register your scoping review protocol um, and it becomes publicly available and you can um, refer, refer or reference it um, in your um, review manuscript. Um, and then there are quite a few different journals. So for, so for public health, for example, um, DMJ Open is quite a popular one in terms of how quick and efficient they are firstly in just getting in terms of the publication turnaround. Um, they, they publish scoping review protocols, systematic reviews um, publish scoping review protocols. Um, there are some others that do that as well. And then um, there are quite a lot of journals, um, more than the ones I have on here as examples that actually publish the manuscript. So what is generally quite challenging to, to publish is the scoping review protocol and, uh, and identifying a suitable um, a journal for that. But in terms of the, of the scoping review itself, there are quite a lot of content and methodological um, journals that actually publish um, scoping reviews. Okay, thank you. I think that's it from me. Um, just wanted to give a bit of that background and insight into um, reporting and publishing um, of scoping reviews. I'll just see if there are any questions. Um, So there's a question about whether um, protocol registration um, is the same as publishing the protocol. Um, so for scoping reviews, yes. Um, so with scoping reviews, generally because you can't register, there isn't really a lot of uh, places where there isn't a dedicated um, platform for registering scoping review titles. Um, publishing is usually the next best option because what happens when you publish the protocol is that the peer review the peer reviewers would make sure that there aren't any duplicates um, on the same topic of the scoping review you are doing and then of course once you're once it's published it's in the public domain so others then will be able to see that you're working on that particular topic and so um, there's there's that's almost like the publishing is actually, has two benefits to the avoiding the issue of research waste and duplication, but then also for the purposes of getting peer reviewed. So they will give you input into the methods that you're proposing. Um, and it's, it's, it's a good first step if you want to actually publish the scoping review manuscript um, at a later stage. Uh, okay. Yeah, I don't see any other questions or comments. Mary, was there something that you saw earlier that I may have missed? Um, no, I don't think so. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'll just uh, briefly share, quickly share the evaluation form in link to the evaluation form in the chat, please do. Um, evaluate this webinar. We are actually thinking about whether we want to run this same webinar series annually or whether there are other topics that you are maybe interested in. Um, I think the topic of qualitative evidence synthesis, for example, has come up in every of the webinars that we've conducted thus far. So that's, for example, one point of feedback that we'll take. Um, but if there's any other um, feedback that you'd like to provide us or any other links, it would be really useful for you to do so in the evaluation form. Um, yeah, I, I don't see any questions, so there's nothing else from my side, um, except to say thank you very much to Mary um, for sharing her experiences. And um, next week we'll have Manya and Anton who are also PhD students in the School of Public Health sharing their experiences. And they'll be getting into the 
nitty gritty, dirty details of spreadsheets and organizing and data charting and templates and all of that um, fun stuff that one has to um, uh, deal with when you are doing a scoping review. Um, and then I think there's a question about, is it possible to have a program whereby we can work on our reviews collectively? That's um, quite um, a good suggestion actually to have a workshop style um, sort of uh, program rather than just the webinar series. So that's very helpful. It, it would be really good if you could please put this in the valuation form. I might just actually never look at this chat. I'll probably look at the form. I'll look at the forms. I definitely will. Um, and then there's a question about where can we go for support on question formulation? Yeah, I think um, developing the different kinds of questions is definitely something that I think is also a workshop of its own. Um, I can't think of resources right now, but there are some standard frameworks um, that we discussed, I think, um, in session two or three, um, things like SPICE and, and um, equivalent frameworks that are well suited to different types of reviews. I'll, I'll definitely try and think of something. I'm not sure if you if you have um, any specific guidance on this, Mary, um, but the JBI website that Mary spoke about, I'm not sure if, if you did add the link to the chat, is actually a very good place to, to learn a little bit more about um, the different stages and details um, and, and where they provide resources for how to develop each of the stages of, of the scoping review. Yeah, I put the link in um, yeah. to the chat. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you for attending. Um, thank you for all the questions and the comments. Um, we really appreciate everyone attending and staying on um, till the end. Um, and yeah, I look forward to seeing um, some of you in little squared boxes on my screen next week. Um, yeah, take care um, and we'll send the link um, for the recording um, via email to you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.